unreasonable. It's how you have to be if you want to change things. Relentless. Tenacious. The world's children need people like that. People who see impossible as incentive to try harder. Who find one good reason to keep going in the face of a thousand reasons to stop. So, shout out to the hardcore. Because big problems need big solutions from big game players. You know the type. The determined. The persistent. The unreasonable. UNICEF. In more than 190 countries and territories, we never give up until the rights of every child are protected. Are you with us? UNICEF. For every child. Hello everyone and welcome to the first event of the year in the One UN Diverse Talent series of career webinars. Many thanks first of all to the United Nations volunteers for hosting this event on LinkedIn Live and many thanks also to colleagues around the globe from more than 20 UN agencies, funds and programs who came together to make this happen today. My name is Juana Ungurano. I work with UNHCR in Budapest, Hungary, and I will be your host for the next 45 minutes. I am thrilled to be here with you today, along with our distinguished panel of industry experts from around the world. Would you let us know in the comments where you are joining us from? For those of you who may benefit from closed captioning, please check out the comment section where my colleagues are providing the link to watch the event via the UN Careers YouTube channel. And before we introduce our panelists in a few minutes, let us first introduce the United Nations System of Organizations, which is formed around the UN's principal organs, as well as 30 affiliate funds, programs, specialized agencies, and other organizations and bodies. The UN and UN system entities collaborate to achieve global sustainable development goals and shape multilateral initiatives that impact millions of people globally. Today's event is part of that collaboration because with this event series, we are bringing together more than 20 of those multilateral organizations to give you all some insight into careers in the UN system. And in order to accomplish such important mandates, the UN system, of course, needs to employ a variety of skills and capabilities. As you know by now, our theme today is careers in emergency logistics and operations within the UN system. We hope that today's discussion will provide valuable insights into the exciting and dynamic field of this work and inspire the next generation of professionals to pursue careers in this area. To that end, I wanted to note that the United Nations is committed to creating a diverse and inclusive environment of mutual respect. The UN recruits and employs staff regardless of gender identity, sexual orientation, race, religious, cultural, and ethnic backgrounds or disabilities. Above all, we are looking for candidates who are passionate about making a difference in the world, and we'd love for you to join us in doing so. Of course, you can find all currently available job openings on the respective organization's career pages, but here today, we have the unique opportunity to get a real candid look into what it means to work as an international professional on a daily basis from a panel of industry experts from around the globe who will share with you how they got to where they are today. <laughs> and without further ado, let's introduce our panelists and learn a bit more about them. First, we have Arno Blasi from the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, UNHCR for short, my colleague, who is joining us also from Budapest, Hungary. Arno currently works as the Chief of Supply Logistics Section, leading the Emergency Order and Transportation Unit at the global level. He brings more than 20 years of extensive field experience in refugee and humanitarian aid in various countries across West and Central Africa, East Asia, Middle East Africa, Middle East Africa, and has worked in various roles, including operations, supply chains and management, and also has worked in other UN agencies, such as the World Food Programme, the German Development Agency, GIZ, and international non-governmental organizations. A very well, welcome, warm welcome to Arno. Our next panelist is Sandra Diaz 
from the United Nations Office for Project Services, UNOPS, who is joining us today from Madrid, Spain. Sandra currently works as a search mechanism coordinator at UNOPS, where she provides leadership to the search team and extends support to country offices and projects. In her capacity, she efficiently coordinates and deploys ad hoc resources to provide temporary assistance to projects facing critical challenges and emergency responses. Over the course of her 15-year career, Sandra, a former engineer, has extensive experience in working on both humanitarian crisis and long-term development interventions. She has played a pivotal role in the successful execution of large-scale programs and projects focused on sustainability and resilience infrastructure. Her professional journey spanned across the private sector and INGOs, having worked in over 20 cross countries across four continents. Great to see you, Sandra, and welcome. Our third panelist, we have Mary Geliti from the World Food Program, WFP in short, who is joining us from Rome, Italy. She is currently working as Deputy Global Logistics Cluster Coordinator, where she is at the forefront of collaboration in humanitarian logistics, leading projects focused on preparedness, environmental sustainability and digitalization, as well as supporting cluster operations around the world. Over the course of her 15-year career, she has extensive experience working in the humanitarian sector, including international non-governmental organizations like Save the Children, Danish Refugee Council, Oxfam, Intermon, Pact, and Goal before joining WFP last year. What an incredibly diverse panel, and thank you all for joining us today. A quick note that our fourth and final panel member had an unexpected emergency and could not join us today, but we will hear from him next time. For now, let's move into the discussion with our panel members. I think the first question I have for you is, can you tell us a bit about your current work and prior professional background and how did you start your career with the UN? And maybe Mary, if you'd like to start. Sure, I will do. Um, my current role with the Global Logistics Cluster um, is uh, extremely rewarding. The, for those who aren't aware, the Logistics Cluster is one of the um, cluster system um, and we assist humanitarians to coordinate during times of emergency to ensure that in the whole response we don't have any gaps in delivery to beneficiaries and we're not duplicating efforts and this is really key of course we want to make sure that we're not wasting money and as much money as possible goes to uh, the people who really need it so the role of the clusters um, is, is highly important. The logistics cluster also assists the humanitarian community, if necessary, with providing common services such as transport and warehousing. Um, so this, this kind of work is, is really important um, to make sure that uh, we deliver as efficiently uh, and effectively as possible during responses. Um, prior to this role, which is my first role with the with the UN, with the World Food Programme. I spent the last 15 years working with NGOs, uh, as mentioned by uh, Oana, uh, working largely in logistics and procurement around the world, um, notably uh, places like South Sudan, Lebanon and Libya, among others. Um, how I got there from here? Uh, I started out, obviously, with those NGOs. I started as an intern. Uh, actually at Save the Children in London, in Save the Children UK. Uh, and through that, uh, was able to get some field experience, um, which is really crucial, uh, I think, in this field, particularly in logistics. This field experience brought me in contact with the logistics cluster in the countries where I was working. Uh, and then as I progressed through my career in NGOs, um, working at HQ level, I had more engagement with the cluster and eventually applied for a role that was available. Um, and and um, I think it's important to note that my background work with the international NGOs as a partner of the logistics cluster was a key factor uh, in my recruitment here. Thank you, Mary. This was very insightful input. Arno, would you like to go next and share how did how you started your career with the with the UN? 
Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. So currently, I'm, I'm as you as you rightly mentioned, I'm currently leading the logistics sections of UNHCR, which includes the emergency preparedness, the rapid deployment of resources, the response, and that would generate the need to inter to integrate the transport management at global level and the order management in general. Um, to give you an example, we are currently in UNHCR managing uh, global stockpiles in seven specific locations aiming to cover more than a million beneficiaries at any given time. But before that, and like many around this table, um, I have a peculiar profile nurtured by my 25 years of work experience in supply operation management. Uh, with an educational background in political science and international law, I started working in more in development in project management but then i rapidly shifted to the humanitarian field where i found a personal urge to act swiftly i have although i have a dis, dic, deep respect for development and public aid at that time my personality wasn't fully aligned with its stakes so i needed to move into emergency and as an emergentist i worked 10 years with various international ngos uh, before joining the UN, uh, mainly in uh, particularly challenging and, and remote locations, especially in large-scale crises. Uh, this would be, for instance, the conflict in Sierra Leone and Liberia, the aftermath of the Darfur crisis, the tsunami response in Banda Aceh, or uh, the high food prices that hit uh, West Africa during the first decade of 2000. And as a segue, because the NGOs are partners often with multiple UN agencies, uh, I had then an opportunity to work for two years with the WFP, uh, first as a UNV and then uh, followed by a consultancy role. And during that time, UNHCR was opening kind of recruitment tests for external roster, especially due to the difficulties in recruiting for uh, and in the most uh, dangerous location at that time, which were Somalia or Iraq. And this is how I obtained my first contract with the UNHCR in Iraq. Uh, where uh, as UN humanitarian, we were also a, a target and threatened target. But we had a massive IDP population, internally displaced population, uh, which was triggered by the invasion. And since then, I moved on with various uh, field locations and then regional bureaus and very recently headquarters. Thank you. No, thank you, Arno. Uh, what a nice historical uh, um, what a nice career you have had as well and sandra would you like to share your professional background so far and how you started your first your first job with UNOPS? sure thank you very much everyone for being part of this event tonight today sorry so uh, i'm gonna start in the reverse mode so how i started my professional journey and how that took me to where i am today so i started uh, working in arup in london uh, which is an international engineering firm, quite large. Uh, and surprisingly, uh, my background is aerospace engineering, so I used to be an airport designer. However, I soon realized that my passion was related to work uh, for international development. And so I did a master's and, and changed my career path quite quickly at the beginning. Uh, while I was in Arup, uh, I worked as an international development consultant for several UN agencies and international organizations providing technical assistance in resilience and sustainable infrastructure. And this allowed me to take part in a very interesting assignment in Uganda, collaborating with Radar and Engineers Without Borders on WASH projects for rural communities, which then inspired me to co-fund my own NGO in Uganda afterwards. So building on this, I had then the opportunity to work for ACON to lead the Water and Sanitation Implementation Unit within the International Development Department. Uh, we had uh, some very interesting projects, as for example, creating uh, the Water and Sanitation Agency in Cape Verde uh, back then. So at that point, my, my journey then took me uh, into the humanitarian sector, and I, I work as a WOS Emergency Coordinator in several countries uh, like Syria, Malawi, or Ecuador. And then it was around seven, eight years ago when I had the opportunity to join UNOPS, going back to where I first started. So my first post in UNOPS was in Uganda as a senior project manager and head of office. 
And since then, the journey has been super exciting. I've been deployed uh, as the team leader for the National Resilient Program in Bangladesh. Uh, then I've also been uh, the head of programs in Costa Rica, Panama, and the Caribbean. And with all these experiences, uh, I have been able to set my transition uh, into my core role, which is the search uh, mechanism coordinator, as it's been mentioned, um, where I manage a large pool of experts that we deploy to support UNOPS country offices that are face, facing critical challenges, including uh, responses to emergencies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandra. I see all of you have mentioned passion and the calling when you talked about your first jobs with the UN. And I think this is something we have to remember that our staff, they are passionate and they are engaged and they feel a calling when they first join the UN. Um, my next question is about the link between your current work and your professional background. Can you, can you maybe elaborate how exactly is your professional and educational background linked to your current position? And Mary, can I, can I ask you to take the floor? Sure, of course. Um, it's an interesting answer for me because the, the short version or the paper, the on paper version is um, my background is not really related to the work that I do in emergency logistics. Um, my academic background, uh, I have a, a bachelor's degree in English literature. And I spent uh, several years after my um, undergraduate degree working in a bookshop, uh, which at first glance doesn't seem like a natural fit for uh, emergency logistics. But um, through that, obviously, I was continuing education and finding things out. And, you know, in your, as you do in your early 20s, finding your place in the world. Um, and I um, was very lucky to be accepted on to an internship with Save the Children UK, as I mentioned. Um, and I found that actually, although on paper that seems like a very odd switch, uh, I had many transferable skills. Um, particularly, of course, when you're working in retail, you're talking about stock management um, and uh, customer service. Uh, those some of the skills that I learned there have been surprisingly helpful uh, through my career. Uh, in the humanitarian world. And of course, um, you know, standard uh, team management, budget management, um, this kind of things are, are, are incredibly useful anywhere you go. Um, so I think that that's um, something that I found out. And of course, then progressively speaking, both with the, the internship with Save the Children UK, but also through various deployments, um, uh, learning the craft, if you will. And I think I, I found that um, the way that I like to, to lead people is that I wouldn't ask somebody to do something that I wouldn't or couldn't do. So I find it very useful to have um, sort of worked my way up from the ground uh, and, and have a really full understanding of um, what goes on and what is involved uh, in many of the different tasks that are done by the teams that I work with. Thank you, Mary. And uh... Sandra or Arno, would you like to add anything? Mm. I will then move to the next question. And Arno, I will put you here on the spot. Um, what are the most challenging things about working in emergency logistics and operations? And in your opinion, what makes people successful in their role? Well, thank you for this question. And uh, I, I could see already in the challenge challenge we, we observe in emergency and logistics, four areas, four main areas. Uh, the first one is, and especially logistics supply chain in humanitarian context is rather different from the one we have in the private sectors, for instance. It is heavily unpredictable and particularly at the dawn of an emergency and would not necessarily allow for a, a, a sound planning and forecasting theoretically. So you basically have to adapt, engage, and be as uh, open as possible in your cross-functional skills, in the way you want to uh, understand the situation and the, the, the context where you operate. It does improve after when the situation, when the emergency got stabilized and when we move into some protracted situation. So here, the planning is some, somehow a bit stronger. The second part I would say is resource related. And here it's also logistics, transportations, especially 
where we operate, we are not like in a standard markets. We are not in Europe, Asia, uh, Middle East. We are in locations which are ranked in South Sudan, Abishe and Chad, uh, locations extraordinarily challenging, extraordinarily hard to, to reach, especially sometimes during, during the, the, some, some seasonal changes. So here the resources are critical for uh, the emergency and logistics particularly. It represents a large cost for the operation. And uh, that is also the reason we are uh, particularly modest, if not weak in some sense, to uh, under the emergency preparedness, because it's difficult to preposition if you want, if you have the possibility in these locations due to the resource. So there's an acting fundraising which is operated and, and nowadays there's a bit of more ability, uh, a bit of more experience uh, that we, we, we try to develop in, in fundraising with the private sector, particularly in the organization. Um, the third one is um, the this uh, resources that could be made available during a response and then hence provide the leeway, uh, maybe sometimes would lead into fierce competition among humanitarian actors. We are human. There's a necessary uh, um, communication aspect to it. And uh, so it could be the race for airlift, the race for access, who will be the first to put any flag. It's not Iwo Jima. However, uh, we need to be careful on that. And over the last decade, um, the UN have invested significantly in logistic cluster sectors, uh, working groups to uh, analyze um, the, core, the, for instance, the core relief item distribution, the cash assistance, and that streamline more and uh, uh, aims for efficiency. The last one is a bit more complicated to tame because it's it's actually unfortunately the major pattern nowadays from my observation after years in Middle East and 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 also in other locations is the politicized environment. Humanitarian aid is more and more politicized. Uh, we we can observe this regression by the lens of our harder access to some locations, if if not no access. It could be from the receiving countries. It could be from governments in general, outsiders, influencers, medias, uh, and of course donors who may have like a very restricted contribution, very tightly earmarked contribution. And this one is the, the, the trickier to, 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 to master from, from an emergency logistics perspective. So because we are depending, we are depending on multiple external factors. So here there is a combination of advocacy and uh, it required a huge sense of uh, collective collectiveness to, to try to, to overcome it. But, but it's clearly one of the major challenge I could see right now. And I think I will stop there at this stage. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. <clears throat> this was very insightful, Arno. Um, I would like to ask uh, Mary, would you like to add anything? I'd like to absolutely echo uh, everything that Arno said. These are absolutely um, some of the greatest challenges that we face at the moment working in emergency logistics. And, and perhaps to, um, to address the second part of the question um, instead and to say what makes people successful in their role. I think if you look at the broad spectrum of these challenges, what you need to be as a logistician is flexible, adaptable and proactive. Um, and for me, within those things, the key part is to listen to other people. Now, of course, I'm in logistics cluster. We're all about coordination. So you might say you would say that. But even in my prior roles uh, as an operational logistician, it's so important to understand the why of what you're doing um, and, and to be very close with the technical program people and understand, okay, what are we trying to achieve? Um, because if they say, okay, I want this box to go from A to B uh, and I want it done this way. But if you understand what they're trying to achieve and the why they're doing it, you might be able to suggest a better, more efficient, cheaper way of doing it to them. Um, and it might even be that you'll be able to get uh, the information in advance of when you need it. Um, the goal of any logistician in life. So I think, uh, yeah, very important to 
not just be in sort of invested in the general mission, but to actually understand the specifics of the programs that you're supporting uh, and be really in touch with what they're trying to get out of it. Thank you so much, Mary. And Sandra, I think that we're moving to my favorite question now. How do you take care of yourself and of your colleagues working in, emer in the emergency settings? Uh, thank you. Uh, so, for me, uh, this is this is key. How we ensure well-being uh, of our colleagues and and ourselves uh, while we work in emergencies. So, well, especially as I mentioned, leading a, a team of uh, a large team of of people that were under a lot of pressure and transition uh, rapidly from one assignment to another uh, required then very often to deliver at the best performance within a very short time frame. So that means uh, that it's, it's very, very important to ensure that they have time and support to recover after an assignment. Uh, what I've done is to implement some procedures to support and coordinate, to support them and in coordination uh, with our wellbeing team in UNOPS, where we have established a protocol that involves collaboration with the Rome Institute, which provides access to professional counselors for our team before, during, and after an assignment. Um, it is also important to acknowledge proactive support. Uh, so even before someone is deployed to, to an assignment, what can we do to ensure that we provide with the right tools? Uh, what I've done is to arrange monthly webinars in collaboration with the Ombudsman Office. Uh, these webinars covers a, a, a range of topics, like for example, managing emotions or, or conflict resolution, and this help us then to navigate challenging situations uh, when we face them uh, in different assignments. Uh, I would say the third thing that is, is key for me is uh, utilizing to the extent possible the policies on flexible work arrangements uh, to, to ensure that we uh, maintain and balance uh, our personal and professional lives, uh, and this is particularly crucial and, and, and useful when assignments can be or are performed remotely. Uh, and then the last thing that I would like to mention is that uh, listening, as it's been mentioned right uh, before I, I started, is key. So having regular catch-ups with my team, uh, wherever they are, uh, that creates a space for us to share professional and personal experiences. And this really allows us to build a team uh, where we feel all part of the same, with the same values and the same, the same goals, but also similar challenges. So in these spaces, uh, we kind of share and coach ourselves. Uh, and this is really, really available to be able to create those spaces wherever you are sitting in the world, supporting uh, these different emergencies. No, thank you, Sandra. And having worked in emergencies myself, I know that there is always a dilemma between looking after ourselves and delivering at best, and it's important to find the balance. Uh, Mary, would you like to add your views on how you look after yourself and after your colleagues? Um, on, a, on an individual, on a personal level, I think for me it's important to keep in touch with, with family, um, and make sure that, that it keeps you kind of grounded in ordinary life, if I can put it that way. Um, uh, but although it's often it's often difficult, uh, especially if you're in a very challenging situation, to know what to share with family. Uh, but still, I think it's important to maintain those connections. Um, looking after team members um, uh, as a manager it's just very important to make space for people to be people uh, and it not just to be about um, sort of the function and, and they're not they're not a, a bit of a machine but that to have space to even 30 seconds at the start of a meeting to say how are you no really how are you uh, and how are things going it makes people feel um, a little bit uh, seen and a little bit appreciated um, and uh, and it can really make all the difference, of course. And and then I think being understanding about the challenges that life brings um, for anybody, uh, you know, um, they they have a life outside work. Um, 
they have uh, responsibilities and, and and things they have to do, um, and respecting that 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 one hundred percent of their being is not about work uh, also gives people um, a sense of relief and assurance. I think uh, so. That that would be um, my main uh, my main takeaway. That. No, thank you so much, uh, Mary. The power of good morning and how are you, and the power of listening and of being humans, of course. Arno, what is what are your tips? Yeah, a few things. One is, of course, related to the positive feedback. It's very important in what you in in the way you engage with your team. Uh, it's also to instill to your team and to yourself what I always call the triangle of life, which is a a sound, a sound balance between rest, even in emergency on onset. Always try to make sure that your body is you. You manage to 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 preserve your body and have some rest at some point. Work and the last one, which is outside, which is family, leisure, art, whatever would make and maintain the center of gravity among these three uh, uh, elements of the triangle. Um, and the last uh, part, and it's mainly related to the team, to the management of the team, but it is some, 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 something as well. I, I was lucky to be uh, under this game is there uh, as much as possible to instill the idea of an horizontal management, being inclusive, not being uh, uh, at the top of a pyramid. After all, we are humanitarian. Um, we have a design which is very, very um, military centric in the past, and it's changing new methods, new perspective on management makes a huge difference on the trust uh, you put onto your team and all the trust you can yourself develop if you have a, a, a conducive environment to, 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 to disclose your level of creativity and initiative. So that's for, for sure the element I would factor. Thank you so much, um, Arno. <clears throat> And uh, the next question I have for you is, what was the best moment of your career? And Arno, I, I will start. I will start with you. <laughs> I will look like an old soldier, but I, actually, I didn't have to think twice about finding an answer to that question, because the best moments are always a combination of multiple factors, a synthesis of what justify why we should keep the experience engraved in our minds. In my time as an emergency coordinator, leading convoy under. Uh, Voluntary repatriation, a vulnerable situation in West Africa was by far the best experience I had. Uh, just set, setting up quite quickly the context, every week we were repat repatriating a caseload of 500 refugees located in remote Guinea to various locations scattered in Sierra Leone over a weekly five-day trip. So you are essentially working in two countries, the country of asylum and the country of origin. It was therefore at this stage already a culturally Enriching, enriching experience. And every week you would embark on a sort of massive road trip with 500 people who were happy to return home after a decade in the camps. Professionally, you had to prepare a complex logistics project. You have to, to plan for a trip, a long trip, three transit centers to manage. It's a five-day trip. Management of personal effects, suitcase, ambulances, securities, you name them. Mobile workshop in case of uh, trucks um, uh, stop. Organizing wake-up calls, departures early morning, early arrival, providing food on board. It was actually the best school to learn about the field on a logistics impediment. On a human level, there were stories every week because you are dealing with a caseload every week. Children and women and all generation were happy to come back to the promised land. It felt like experiencing a new road novel, a road movie. The first mile when the promised land was rediscovered, the tensions that could arise during a trip as it happens in a family trip or a friend trip, the stress, the smile, the fun, and the tiredness. It was always rewarding because we knew that at the end of the journey, it was a durable solution we're providing. So of course, a great moment because it was at the crossroads of multiple elements, humanity, collective efforts, a lot of partners involved, and a durable solution, which is one of, of our major mandate. And uh, during that time, we, in safety and dignity, we, we managed to repatriate more than 40,000 people, multiple convoys every week. In this very particular form of assistance, ultra field related, but for sure, uh, for me, it's the, it's, it's the experience I will keep at the end of my time um, uh, with this work. 
I don't know, this kind of <clears throat> stories make me want to go back to the field and working in emergencies again. Um, Mary, would you like to share your best memory from your career? Uh, um, I mean, there's a lot of them, um, I suppose, of different different facets and different organizations. One that, that sort of sticks out to me uh, uh, in a very technical, professional way um, would be when I was working in, in Lebanon with the Danish Refugee Council. And we ended up with this, um, uh, you know, warehouse network. Um, I, I should say at this point, this was the, the, the Danish Refugee Council's largest uh, program at that time by uh, a long way. Um, and we had this um, very large warehouse network. Of, we had 10 warehouses, 10,000 square meters across the country, um, ensuring that we were able to deliver assistance. This was during the beginning of the Syrian civil war uh, back in 2012, 2013. And we had a lot of people coming over the border into Lebanon um, uh, with, with very little or nothing in their hands. Uh, and so we were able to set up this network and, and have um, pre-positioned items in. So everybody was able to receive some basic goods, hygiene items, um, blankets, this sort of thing. So at least, you know, they were they were going to be able to um, have something to eat, uh, have somewhere to sleep and uh, uh, be able to sort of keep themselves uh, with a bit of dignity. Um, and just being able to set that up so that we could respond to people literally within 12 hours of them coming into the country uh, is something that, that I think I'll always be proud of. Uh, although obviously there's a number of stories that I'm sure we could all tell. 12, 12 hours seem like a very short time frame. What, a, what an inspiring story. And Sandra, would you like to share your best experience? Thank you. Well, similarly, it's difficult to, to make a choice, but I remember when after the earthquake hit Ecuador a few years ago, uh, being able to support the, the response and provide uh, support to government and and all those families that lost access to to water, sanitation, and, and health was uh, was really rewarding. Uh, uh, being able myself to walk up in the mountains and so to to ensure that those that were not in in the in the center of the cities were also uh, take it into account and and ensure that they had access to basic things like health kits or, or distribution of, of water uh, if they lost their, their access to it. It was it was a, a great uh, moment to see the gratefulness of people that they lost everything they had, but then uh, were very resilient to go back and, and, and kind of rebuild uh, their lives and put, put them back in track to the extent possible. And it's these kind of memories that bring us back to work every day and then bring joy to our work. Thank you so much for sharing, Sandra. And I think it's time for my last question, uh, because our audience consists mainly of potential job candidates. What is your key takeaway or advice for the, our audience? And Arno, would you like to start? OK. Um, I will start with uh, this extract of a poem that everybody knows. Do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. We are among the lucky ones, we humanitarian. We are the ones who helped. We are not the ones who are helped. And yet we are a teeny grain of hope for people. But what we do bring sense to life. And um, my first take will be be open to challenges. Our human humanitarian life is first and foremost cultural discovery. You will work with many other profiles, many other nationalities in various contexts. There should not be any restriction of any, on any sort of contract to start with. It could be humanitarian worker, intern, GPOs, UNV, short-term contract. At the end, it's discovery or what you can contribute to do if you have the passion and the enthusiasm. And then, and then after, you can think of working for your name and the name will work for you. The second one will be be bold. Do not spend two minutes considering where you will live. Um, I've seen beauties everywhere. Uh, some locations are 
highly challenging, but again, I've seen beauties everywhere. Consider it as a life school. I've noticed certain significant personal restriction nowadays when it comes to pursuing deep field experience. It's a pattern we've observed in my unit when it's about emergency deployment. The field experience is a sample of the complexity of the humanitarian work, but it is a huge experience. The third one will be to be cross-functional, to engage. Along with your experience, you may develop appetite for new themes and new functions. Try to reflect and integrate these new elements in your career. Try to see where you see yourself it more and try to try. Decades ago, cash assistance, for instance, was a vague plan. Now it is reality. Biometrics, data management, this, this was uh, hardly some words we were talking about decades ago. And now we can embrace and we can, they are because they are embedded in what we do, you can also uh, develop expertise into that areas as well. And it's a segue with the, 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 the point I wanted to make about the tools and the means available. The flow of information is huge and unique nowadays. We have access to any sort of documents. We can know nearly a context, starting knowing a context before even going there. Uh, more than ever, everyone is equipped to integrate some areas of interest and to develop them. And last, it's the network, of course. At the end, sound collaboration means sharing common experiences. And this is a long journey uh, to engage, to make friends, to network. But the network help to scan opportunities and, and, and move on. So this will be my, my, my few, my few points. Thank you so much, Arno. Before I pass the floor to Sandra, I would just like to like to our audience that the websites where you can find our vacancies are currently in our banner on the screen. So you can find vacancies for United Nations volunteers, for UNHCR, for UNICEF, for UNOPS, and for WFP. And uh, Sandra, your tips for potential applicants. Thank you. So what I would say is that uh, you go for those opportunities that make you feel passionate. Uh, find the challenge that you want to address and embrace opportunities along your journey to keep growing and learning, which is fundamental. Uh, be a good team player and look after those that you work with and for. Uh, don't forget that you work for people and people normally in need if you work within emergencies of development. So don't lose the, the line of sight on the impact that you're trying to make that should be always your focus. Uh, reflecting on my own experiences, being open has been crucial and recognizing the importance of remaining receptive to diverse opportunities has played a significant role in shaping my journey. Uh, to end, I would say just uh, keep the focus on what uh, you enjoy and, and do your best and don't fear jumping into different challenges. Everything uh, that you do, if you do it with passion, will, will have a, a positive impact. Thank you so much, Sandra. The passion is coming very strongly from humanitarians, obviously. And Mary, your tips? I'm not sure how I can follow the poetry and the passion. Um, but uh, I think the, the key point for me is about operational experience. about, And it's a, it follows a bit Sandra's point about jumping in. Uh, being a part of emergency response operations, understanding the pressures and the challenges, understanding the context and how all the different types of organizations work together can be a huge asset. Um, the flexibility and adaptability that I referred to earlier on, they're a bit like muscles that you need to build up uh, over the course of your career. And, and I think for me, the best way to do that is by experiencing these different contexts and challenges learning from others, listening to others, and, and finding your own way through them. But I um, uh, would fully agree with Sandra, don't be afraid to jump in. No, thank you so much. And uh, this concludes our session today. Thank you to our wonderful panelists for sharing their valuable insights with us and to the United Nations volunteers for hosting this discussion on LinkedIn Live. And to all of you, of course, for joining us for this one UN webinar on careers in the UN system. 
As we have learned from our speakers today, this is an exciting and rapidly evolving field with ample opportunities for those who are passionate about innovation, efficiency, and creating new opportunities for positive change. We encourage you to take the insights you came today and apply them to your own career journey. Whether you're just starting out or looking to take the next step in your career, there are wealth of open positions available for you to apply across our various organizations. And you can see them in the banner on the screen now. We we'll look forward to hearing from you with job applications to any of our UN system organizations in this exciting and dynamic field. Thank you and have a great rest of your day or of your evening. Volunteering is giving, sharing, standing by others, supporting causes you care about, and creating a better future for everyone. This is why more and more entities support volunteering to achieve the sustainable development goals. Volunteers make a difference to the lives of many. Volunteer today for a better tomorrow.